So that was, that was fun. Um, why don't we open up for questions and comments? And the presenters should also feel free if they have comments and questions for each other. Any questions or comments? Thanks. Um, thanks very much. Wonderful uh, set of papers. Um, I was I was uh, struck by the by the use of the term rents in both of the country study papers, and um, it strikes me that that's you know maybe may, I don't know the literature that well, so maybe everybody's taken that on board. But when you start talking about the consequences of these policies, you know when you do standard economic analysis of the of the losses, of the downside, then of, often people model this as a sort of highly competitive economy, you know, economic situation. Um, and, um, but both of, both of you were saying, well, that's just not the right way to anchor the thing at all. And in fact, Ayabonga's presentation was very strong on, on concentration and ex actually how the industrial structures in your case, uh, you know, um, work. Um, and I was, you know, so it, it I mean, I'm not, so maybe you can respond to that. It just struck me that that's a crucial point almost to make, you know, conceptually in, in working out, okay, but how does one evaluate the, these uh, policies um, in terms of their impacts? Um, and you've got to ground that in the actual reality of what those, so, so Ayabonga spoke about the long history of racial capitalism in South Africa. That's not just a, a footnote, because um, that imposed a certain structure on the, on the whole enterprise within which you then try and insert uh, a very complicated, uh, what Edmund called like a very rich and complicated and intersecting type of a process. So anyway, that's just maybe you want to pick up on that and, and talk about it a bit. It's just that, you know, the sort of stylized fact of private sector markets are increasingly being analyzed as monopsonies. So this concept of a rent is embedded in the very working of, the, of that market before any policies come to play. Um, uh, and then um, I just had a much more specific comment for, for Edmund. You, you know, you spoke about the education and the educational expansion. But then you also, in the beginning, you also framed the discussion in terms of universalism versus targeting. And I was wondering whether the education policies are, are part of the affirmative action or whether they're, whether they're more universalist policies that are highly relevant to you know, because that was the big success, and it and it really undergirded the support of the affirmative action. Presentations that the, the sort of the role and the capability of the state come out as being really important in the implementation of of the policies, which then affects the the, the politics, the, you know, which just rolls up with the politics of, of how they're implemented. So I I wonder your thoughts on that. I mean, what aspects of of the state are most important? And then I think for Simona, it's maybe something we didn't capture in the, in the database. I mean, there's certainly indicators of the state that we could bring in, but maybe it's something we want to think about incorporating. Why don't we start with those, and then we'll open up for more questions or comments if there are. We'll go in the order of, of speaking. So Edmund, you're first, or Ter Terrence, you're first. Uh, thank you for your comments on the red. I did end my presentation by arguing why must we focus on equity distribution when we talk about affirmative action. And it's precisely because the focus is on equity redistribution, to my mind, we see all the problems coming up in the market, inefficiencies, and also a sense of alienation, the rise of the diaspora leaving the country, which is detrimental to the country. The people who leave are the people with the most, what I call, class resources. They have education, they have wealth, they have enough ability to go and work anywhere in the world and be very productive. And the other country is the beneficiary. So here, 
I would, in my response to your question, I would first actually post this point to Simone too. What is our definition of affirmative action? I want to be clear on that. When we say affirmative action, what exactly are we talking about? Affirmative action in what way? Positive discrimination? Or is there some other form of affirmative action? And the definition has to be clear. Once the definition is clear, we're introducing the policy. For what purpose are we introducing the policy? Yes, two days ago we heard a paper on Chile, Chile where the focus was clearly on education. Just bring more women into the engineering faculty in the university. That's it. Now, that's not going to cause a lot of tension in the country. No, I'm serious. It's not going to, it's, we're not going to have riots on the streets because of that. But if you have affirmative action which talks about wealth redistribution, then you're going to have problems. Now, those are the questions we've got to ask ourselves. If our focus is rent distribution to bring about equity in distribution of wealth, then this comes to Rachel's question. What is the form of state intervention? Because the way the state intervenes to redistribute wealth becomes crucial. In what form are you intervening? Is it transparent and accountable? Now, when the state intervened in Malaysia, they created public enterprises that targeted rural areas. The state went and did the work for them, developed the land, redistributed the land, and let them live on the land and develop the land thereafter. And they became a new middle class. That form of state intervention is not going to cause problems. In fact, that kind of distribution, redistribution, looking at land in rural areas, which would not otherwise be well employed, is in fact beneficial to the country. And it helps landless people too. Take people who are landless and put them there. And they develop the land. Very important point. So the, how the state intervenes, is, to my mind, Rachel, is very important. That's one form. The second, point, the second form is on the point on education. You raised this point of universalism versus target, targeted type. That's a very important point because the debate now that is going on is should we have HI and VI targeted and universal, universalism together? Don't need, there's no need to make a segregation. Huh? Do it simultaneously. In education, what Malaysia did was we had universal education, high quality universal education, and that carried on even when affirmative action started. But meanwhile, they created a new bunch of residential schools, put the best teachers there, took the poorest kids, and sent them to those schools to get the highest quality education. So while that was going on, the high quality universal education was also going on. You see the point? And it worked. While they created a new, they, they transformed a poor community into a new middle class. Meanwhile, the rest of the nation was still getting high quality education. Until that point in time when there was, the, I raised this issue of institutional decline, which comes to the question of public employment. Public employment in the universities and the schools and the bureaucracy, it will lead to institutional decline. Then the schools are no longer, universal education no longer becomes important. You're not getting high quality education. And so private education becomes. And then everyone wants to go to those targeted schools. Even the elites want to send their children to the targeted schools because it's free education as opposed to going to private education. These are all the outcomes we've got to look at. Because it speaks to the question, again, I come back to Rachel's point, form of state intervention. Access. Who has access is important. Should rich children have access to the targeted schools? Or just because they are from that ethnic group? No, of course not. But unfortunately, that's not how the policy is structured. We come back to the policy. The policy, how is it structured? What's its name? What's its focus? I think those are the issues we need to get into. Because when I give a talk on affirmative action, they'll tell me, this is not affirmative action. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And you had a list of so many countries where you classified them under affirmative action, and I was so happy when Simone said it's not necessarily true affirmative action. We're just looking at discrimination, where discrimination occurs. That's not affirmative action. So the, these things we need to sort out. I really look forward to your work. It's so ambitious. It's really ambitious, honestly, and I wish you well on that. But these are the points that, these are the points we really need to get into so that when we do implement affirmative action, it is seen to a progressive policy, we implement it properly, we know exactly what we're doing, 
and where it is focused on. I feel the focus should not be on the economy. You saw Malaysia and South Africa, same problem. The focus should be on education. Yeah, I mean, just to maybe pick up on something Terence is raising, I, I think even in policy design, a specific focus on race without embedding class is a dead end. Uh, and I think we've seen this. I mean, in the example of Malaysia, you see it also in many examples of post-colonial African societies. Um, this whole idea of Africanizing the bureaucracy, Africanizing the university, is often used opportunistically by certain elites from you know, beneficiary ethnic groups, if I can call it that, um, to pursue their own very narrow projects um, under the cloak of, you know, the race, the group, and so on. And I, th and I think we really need to be cautious of that. You, you know, Mari, I mean, I think you raise a very difficult question there around rents. Uh, and I think rents, even in the theoretical framework, arise from starting or origin assumptions around how markets function. Right, this idea that price embeds certain competitive elements or you know, factor payments to different factors of production. Um, and I think for me, what is often helpful is to separate two kinds of rents. So there are rents that arise from specific peculiarities of market structure, which in some cases might arise as a result of policy sanctioned issues, and in some cases they don't. They arise out of other things that have little to do with policy, but interface with policy. And I think BEE, in particular, is a policy-sanctioned rent. You know, just like the wage premium to unskilled Afrikaner workers during apartheid was a policy-sanctioned rent. Um, and I think, you know, it's quite clear that the operative mechanisms of both might be the same. So it might be markups, it might be premia, it might be welfare or deadweight losses. Um, but really, the origin of the rent itself, I think, is also critical. Um, and I think one of the things that we really start to see even in policy-sanctioned rents around BEE, if your procurement design leaves a lot to chance, you end up having a lot of situations. One of the things I lament is this middleman phenomenon. If you act like you're discovering the market for the first time every financial year, you are incentivizing middle persons. You're incentivizing Ayabonga to come in and you know, import as much as I can because there are two things that you prioritize, my race and the best price. Um, and effectively, what that does is that it sometimes diverges from your other economic objectives, which might be to reindustrialize the economy, broaden your industrial base, and so on. So, so I do think that it's important for us to use the rent lens and even this idea of competitive markets as a starting point, irrespective of the issues I might have with that as a mechanism for a thoroughgoing policy reform that says, actually, you might want to shift how you procure away from this piecemeal approach to a much more targeted framework uh, that you lock in for maybe a longer period so that you can begin to evaluate and monitor that. You know, one of the funniest things is that if you go to state-owned companies and um, municipalities, none of them can actually tell you over the last 10 years the frequency of the things they procured. None of them. They can't tell you, even if my authority is to provide water and sanitation, in the mix of products and services in the provision of water and sanitation, what did I procure more? Was it PVC pipes? Was it VIP toilets? What was it? None of them keep that data. And I think it links to the second part of your, your question, which is, you know, what are these capabilities that we want in the state? And I think we really need to get to a granular and a detailed level. I really think the market intelligence and even that kind of intelligence on what it is that we buy is critical. Um, especially in South Africa where the state is such a dominant buyer, um, even when compared to the private sector. I think the other element is this idea of participatory social dialogue. You know, one of the people I interviewed for the study was um, the social dialogue unit at Sunral. And they can tell you how costly it has been to not go into a community and consult because you end up creating an environment where you open up space for opportunistic elements and violent elements in that community to say, look, they came and built a billion rand road here and they didn't employ any of you. And that creates a certain perverse incentive. I think the other element, of course, is around this idea of embedded autonomy and it comes across quite strongly in the developmental state literature. It's so funny how certain organs of state have become captured and I don't talk about state capture in the Gupta sense now, right? but capture by groups that have the 
political, social capital and the capacity for violence, especially at a municipal and um, you know uh, SOC level, where you know. And it's also because sometimes the mayor is the branch chairperson of the organization and I might be a big power broker inside of the local ANC branch. But what effectively ends up happening is that there is a very strong pandering to the sentiment of those who yield a lot, considerable amount of power because even my stay as a mayor is reliant, not necessarily on my own performance, but effectively on the distribution of power in some of those primordial power bases that I was talking about you know, the ethno-national forms of organization, the political party, and so on. Um, and I do think that, you know, what the National Development Plan had spoken about, which is insulating particular spheres of the state from direct political influence, might be a necessary but not a sufficient condition to deal with this. And part of it is to really build this embedded autonomy in a clear sense of what the state's vision and future might look like. Uh, and I think it's, it's a real pity that we, we really don't even have a a long-term vision and a plan around which we can coalesce. I mean, 2030 is here, so, you know, what happens after 2030? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I think regarding the state capacity, of course, our database would allow it to allow with other data that has information on state capacity. It comes down to how do you measure this, which I think is a discussion in itself. But I think the more difficult part it is, or that has been cracking our brains for quite some time is how do we capture the evolution of a policy? And we tried to do this in the beginning, trying to do, okay, five years after the policy and so on, it proved really difficult. And I think something that the Malaysian case has shown is it can matter a lot for how you assess the policy, basically. And the same, at what time should we assess state capacity? Is it at implementation? Is it at what point should we even merge it in if we wanted to? And I think those are the things we will still need to, to tackle to some extent. And then just on the comment regarding whether the policy targets wealth distribution or maybe has a more direct impact on only education, I think in the end what affirmative action policies do is to redistribute opportunities. Like they, the moment opportunities are limited and you create some for some, there will be others who are losing out. It's kind of this redistribution effect of it. It's kind of hard to circumvent. Of course, you might have, you might say that you're, the non-marginalized group have better outside options, so in the end it doesn't have such a strong effect, but it will depend and it will almost always somehow affect the wealth distribution, just in a more direct or more indirect way. And I think governments have just taken different approaches on how to frame those policies and how direct they would be about the redistributive effect of them. And I think this has mattered a lot of for how they are perceived in the public domain. And it's part of what has made our job quite difficult because you would find countries like Singapore who very much emphasize the merit character but at the same time do have a redistributive element it just framed very differently for example or you have the Brazilian policy where it was mainly there were education quota for racial groups and then it was made to be a quota for public uh, students coming from public schools which are maybe mainly black but it's not any more racial targeted even though it mainly benefits a certain ethnic group and this you might have this other social redistributive programs where you might have like cash transfers going to the poor, which then again benefit certain groups targeting horizontal inequalities and kind of where do you make the cut kind of and how do we only capture those that are directly targeted? What about indirect targeting, etc. And I think it's those, yeah, we will still need to, to deal with. But thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to make one more point on this issue of state capacity before we can talk about state capacity, we must understand the nature of the state. What kind of state are we talking about? Is it a strong state, a weak state? We even talk now about a dysfunctional state. Who has control over the state? Is the state controlled by oligarchs through political financing? Is the state controlled by the military? Is the state controlled by hegemonic party? What is the level of democracy in the sense of defined as devolution of power to ensure checks and balances are in place? All these matter before we can talk about state capacities to implement. What also matters is we have to look at the public sector, the bureaucracy. The capacity of the bureaucracy to conceive policies and change it, it matters. Policies can't be static. They, they have to change as an economy develops. The kind of policy I introduced when the country was developing and the kind of policy I have in the countries now at a highly developed state will be very different. 
And in the process, most countries will tinker with their policies as they develop. Or some cases, they may have wholesale change. Those things too matter. Has the bureaucracy the capacity to bring about the changes in an economy or in the policy framework to deal with the changes that are happening in the economy? The economy is not stagnant. Does the bureaucracy have the ability to bring about policy changes as society evolves, as society moves up the social ladder? These are issues also about state capacities we've got to talk about. And if the state does not have those capacities, then where's the public delivery system to make sure that you rectify these problems that we are talking about? That's why, again, the idea of focusing on politics and the state, I think, is crucial when talking about affirmative action. Thanks very much. Um, just as a final point, I wanted to pick up on one of Simona's comments, uh, the final comment. Um, so I guess in the broader project, we, we try to think about policies to address group-based inequalities of different types. So they're in the collection that, that you both are part of. We, we look at policies that are explicitly ethnically targeted, so the, the type of policies you're doing, but then also um, policies that, that don't explicitly target on an ethnic basis, but have impact on, on ethnic inequality. So that's something we couldn't do at all in the affirmative action database. Just It just wasn't pe feasible to look at sort of the dogs that don't bark. You know, we, we couldn't look at those cases in the, that, that way of um, gathering data. But, but it's something we do try to look at in the broader project. So thank you very much, and thanks for the comment, question, Murray. Thank you.